Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. I was having coffee yesterday with a young man who earnestly desires to get out of the job that he's in now, and He actually is in Christian ministry work, but desperately wants out of the job that he has, which really doesn't have anything in alignment with his heart, passion, desire. He was a young man. He just, you know, so yearned to bring the gospel and to teach. And he's working in that general realm, but what his actual job functions are is you know, event planning, organizational, you know, administrative stuff. And he's just dying in there. And so much confusion over where is God in that story? Gosh, I thought he had something for me years ago. Felt like he spoke some things over my life. And 16 years later, it hasn't really panned out. And the confusion, the disappointment, and oh, just... All that enters in with that, just disheartening and a loss of hope and dreams, but also towards God, Mm -hmm. suspicion, distrust, a sense of you're just not coming through here in this area of my life. You you don't really care, you you know, the mistrust that comes in. So welcome to the Ransom Heart Podcast. We feel like this series on interpretation is just massively important, and particularly as we move into the conversation now about how do you interpret calling, desire, dreams, jobs, vocation? How do you sort that stuff through? I felt like God, in part, gave me coffee with this young man yesterday as a way of reminding me that there's a lot of confusion and disappointment, Mm -hmm. don't you think, Craig, in this realm in particular? Yes. I get to talk to pastors frequently. It's amazing how many pastors feel trapped in their vocation. They started kind of with a zeal and passion to serve God, and being a pastor seemed like the ultimate call, and they achieved that. And then somewhere along the line, whether it's being wounded or deep disappointment or the problems of the church bringing limitations, they just feel trapped. And it's like, I can't do anything else. I'm stuck here. And that probably applies to a lot of people is feeling stuck. Yeah. Or people who, you know, chose a vocation earlier in life and, you know, Mm -hmm. they went to law school or they, you know, took the business track or whatever, came to Christ. Mm -hmm. And now their whole worldviews change, their desires have changed. They're like, man, I... I'm making a living, but I want to do something so much more meaningful with my life. They've got a whole new take on the world and what's important. And I feel like this particular subject especially is just Mm. really important that we bring some clarity to it. And if you've been tracking with us through this series, you know that our primary counsel always winds up Ask Jesus, seek clarity from him, ask for interpretation. John, you seem to be in your sweet spot, but you've got a story of profession, vocation, career, jobs that hasn't always kind of offered you the sweet spot you're in now. What's a bit of your story in this category of confusion, frustration. Is this it? You mentioned uh, you thought you'd end up in the theater. What's your story? Yeah, the story has a lot of twists and turns to it. And I think only in hindsight do I have clarity. But man, Mm -hmm. there were a lot of moments of confusion into what God was doing. I think there's always been this burning desire in me to make a difference. You know, I, I never set out to make a lot of money or to, you know, build a business or a company. Like, those weren't my dreams and ambitions. Those aren't wrong dreams and ambitions, Mm -hmm. by the way. They just weren't mine. And I want to make a difference. 
early in my life, high school, college, I majored in theater. I ran a theater company in Los Angeles in my 20s. And, you know, kind of my dream was to go to the Royal Academy in London and study Shakespeare, to be a Shakespearean actor on the London stage. Like, that would have been the pinnacle. And I actually auditioned for a very high-level Shakespearean company in the United States twice and, you know, didn't get in. And that was very disappointing. And there was confusion and disheartening because you have these dreams in your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, you have these desires and I think those are God-given, mm -hmm. and I think it's important to pay attention to them. But one of the categories I didn't have at the time was mythic versus specific, and that's going to become apparent as I tell my story that, you know, the idea that some desires, dreams that we have, you know, this kind of this longing in us, we might attach it to some specific outcome. Oh, that means I'm supposed to be a teacher in the inner city. Oh, that means I'm supposed to be a missionary, you know, to the Karen people in Burma. We take these desires and we affix them to something specific. I did to acting, theater, Shakespeare, you know. But those may be mythic. In other words, they may be far more kind of metaphorical desires that God is going to take, but apply in a very different way than you thought. Mm -hmm. So I am a communicator. I am meant to change the world. Just I thought it was theater was going to be the means of that, right? Mm -hmm. But those deeper desires of bring the truth, bring a compelling message, do so with excellence, you know, that's remained true all through my story. And, um, actually, there was a betrayal in the theater company that I was involved with. It was very, very painful. We had to shut it down. That was an extraordinarily wounding moment in my life. Loss of dreams, loss of hopes, and in resignation, I just went to, quote, get a job mm -hmm. at that point. It kind of abandoned the dreams, the hopes, and, and that job happened to be in Christian ministry, but I didn't have a ministry-type job. I was just working as a researcher, and you know, and... and it kind of one step led to another. I need to jump ahead to try and connect the mythic and specific. You and I wound up doing sacred romance conferences together. And I will never forget, now this is like 25 years later, that I am upstairs in the balcony of a church watching you give one of the sessions in a sacred romance conference. And some of our listeners will even remember what these were like. But we had these beautiful tapestries, yeah. almost Elizabethan tapestries that hung on either side of the stage. And we had these incredibly beautiful iron candelabras that held about six massive candles each and a pair of those on either mm -hmm. side of the stage. And, and the lights would be dim. And I looked down at it and I went, oh, my goodness, that looks like a Shakespearean set. Mm. And I had never connected those dots. I'd never seen that. And in that moment, 25 years later, after a lot of story, I could say, God, like all along you knew what you were doing. I thought my desires were mm -hmm. for theater and Shakespeare. But you had something much bigger in mind. And yet all along the same the same core desires were there. You yes. were just reshaping them and redirecting them. And so just even that category of the mythic mm -hmm. versus the specific mm -hmm. can be really helpful because I think people will take these core desires and we attach them to things. And then when that particular dream doesn't come true, you know, I never got to open the flower shop. I never got to open a bakery. I, mm -hmm. I never got to teach English as a second language in China, you know, doesn't mean you missed it. Doesn't right. mean life's over. You know, we attach some core essential desires to very specific things. And I think that's one place where some of the confusion gets in. Mm -hmm. John, just simply because you just told a bit of your story, that period of time between the theater company getting shut down, closed down, the betrayal, things not happening there. You talked about a, just a season where you just got a job. What was that like? I mean, that's probably where an awful lot of people are living. It was soul killing. It was horrible, you know. And looking back at it now, I just see there was so much resignation and fear. I had to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. When we lost the theater company, like, 
that was my income. And so I'm scrambling. Like, we got to make rent, you know. So I just went and got a job. And and then here's what happens to so many people as well is I actually did well at it. Yes. And I got promoted in it. And I actually wound up in Washington, D.C., working in research policy and writing. I was a speech writer writing policy papers and op-ed pieces and articles, that kind of thing for the newspaper. And again, I'm bringing a message, mm-hmm. making a difference. You know, you can see the essential gifting there, but I am so lost. I'm just way off down a cul-de-sac. And I've told that particular story other places, but it was funny when I realized I can't take this anymore. Like this was born out of fear mm-hmm. And resignation. I just gotta get a job. Screw my desires. Pardon, you know my language, but that's what's going on inside. Yeah. You're like, forget the dreams. Screw this. You know, I'm just just gonna put my head down and just work. I'm not gonna dream anymore. And it was finally when my soul couldn't take that posture yeah. anymore. As I moved out of resignation and as I moved out of fear, mm-hmm. I was able to move back in the direction of. Dream, desire, longing. And I was having a conversation with a friend, and he was asking me, I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm in policy. I'm in politics. We were just chatting, and he said, so when you go into a bookstore, are those the kind of books you read? Is that kind of where you go? You sort of read policy, history of America, politics, you know, (sighs) kind of read biographies of, you know, famous politicians stuff. And I said, I never read that stuff. (laughs) <laughs> and he was genuinely surprised given my vocation. And he kind of looked at me and he said, well, what do you read? And I said, oh, I go straight for the section on the soul. I read about the heart. I read about human beings, the human heart, the structure of the soul, spirituality, how God works there. And he just kind of smiled and said, I think you're in the wrong line of work. Now, again, you know, pause. <laughs> We live in a broken world. Simply because we have dreams and desires doesn't mean they all get met on this side of the kingdom. I think they are all met on the other side. Because during those same days, actually in that very same season of life, I knew a young man from my past who was a playwright. We had intersected in the theater. And he actually was a very brilliant playwright. He was very talented and very good. But that is a very, very, very difficult field. Few people actually make a living at being a playwright. Few people actually make a living at being an author. I mean, most books never sell more than 5,000 copies, you know, and so you have to do something else. And, yeah. and I was talking to this guy about, you know, his yearning to be a playwright. And he was just agonizing with the difference between job and calling really felt like his calling was not lining up with his vocation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important that we keep that in mind always because those are two different things. And sometimes they don't line up. Yeah. Something you said, John, which sounds kind of just like a preliminary issue to take care of or deal with or face or inventory if you're in that position of this isn't – this job, this vocation is so not what my heart yearns for, is you said you had to deal with a resignation. Mm -hmm. You know, it it feels like before anything else, it's like measure, deal with, face, resignation is a key obstacle here. Yeah. And how are you interpreting this, Mm -hmm. right? Because you're bringing interpretation to it. And this young guy I was having coffee with yesterday the confusion, the disappointment, the resignation all eventually got aimed at God. Hmm. You know, and part of me wants to go, whoa, 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 time out. Like, hang on. This is a series on interpretation. Let's remember mm-hmm. some of our categories, right? You live in a world at war. You live in a broken world. Like, don't just aim all that at God, which I think most of us do. It's kind of our default position of, well, God's clearly not coming through. He doesn't care, you know, and My dreams aren't being realized, so, you know, I'm just going to kill my heart and put my head down. So as you deal with that resignation and confusion and disappointment, and and be very careful who you start blaming all that on or who you already have. You know, we turn on God. Yeah. 
when you just want to say, whoa, 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 this is a broken world. Yeah. Yeah. When you say broken, well, okay. First off, I just think of that's the ancient accusation is God is holding it out on me. Mm. I mean, that's what mm. the serpent, that's what Satan used against God was the accusation, you're holding something out on me. And the reality of a broken world is economy, limitations in an industry can keep you from getting that dream, vocation, job, opportunity. There may be financial restrictions. You may have educational, physical limitations. I mean, there's the reality of living in a broken world is there's far more limitations than we we're ever designed to kind of uh, live under, and they limit an awful lot of our dreams and hopes. And Craig, I think that in the West in particular, and in the education system in the West, I think a great disservice has been done to people because from when we were young all the way through our children's education, the mantra has been, you can do anything. Yeah. Reach for the stars. You know, that's the classic high school graduation speech, you know. Aim for the moon, and if you don't hit it, you'll land among the stars. <laughs> you know, and you go, wait, 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 wait. That's just naive thinking. Hang on, time out. Like, you're never going to be an astronaut. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be a professional baseball player. It's not going to happen. Like, it's not mean to say that. It's kind to say, hang on, hang on, like this idea that, you know, life is an oyster, you just have to open it, I think has led many people to have Pollyannish expectations, very naive expectations about what God will do and what life can be. Yeah. Now, how many young musicians, right, yes. are just thinking that, you know, they're going to be the one. How many young basketball players are thinking they're going to be the one? It's going to happen for me. And, you know, pause. You live in a broken, war-torn mm -hmm. world. And how essential to walk with God, how crucial to walk with God. You know, as you interpret desire, mm -hmm. dreams, vocation, direction, calling, I think that he does have so much for every one of us. I'm not saying that. Just saying that, that that idea of the world is your oyster, just go for it, I think it's left a lot of people shocked and disappointed yeah. because of economies, world changes, changes in career fields, right. you know, whole towns shut down because the, the plant moved out of town or the coal mine ran out or, you know, industries change. And you say, right, right, right. As you're interpreting your life, just don't forget broken world. Yeah. And that so much of even what has shaped our desires, our vocational goals, has been shaped by the woundedness of others. I'm thinking of a very successful doctor who um, just seems to have everything going for him. And he absolutely hates it. Just absolutely hates being a doctor. Pushed into being a doctor by you know, parental pressure and siblings that were moving towards different professions, and it was a high-achieving family. And I, I remember uh, just being stunned by a guy having so much success would actually hate it. And I asked him what he wanted to do. He says, I'd love to work with horses on a ranch. Mm. So far afield yes. from what he was doing. And I just thought, you know, bummer in this world, someone didn't raise up that child in the way that he should go. Yes. And directed, pushed, validated, and affirmed into something now that at 40 is just the life he doesn't want to have. That's an expression of the broken world. Broken parents often raise broken children. Mm. Yep. Broken systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really huge. And again, the confusion, the disappointment, the disheartening that comes with that, those are things that God can address. Like he can address the disillusionment. Yes. He can address the disheartening. He can address resignation and fear. You want to invite him into those things right away before you figure out mm -hmm. what's next. We so quickly go to, well... I'll get rid of the resignation, fear, cynicism, 
disheartening once I'm working with horses. You know, mm-hmm. wait, whoa, 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 wait. God has a lot for you in the meantime. Right. You know, you don't know the direction of your life, but don't wait, you know, to open that flower shop to then trust God. Don't wait to work with horses to deal with the disappointment and resignation. Like, start there. Start in the heart. Start with dreams, hopes, desires, disappointments, inviting Christ into those things. Yeah. And I think in that, while we may feel we're living in a very small story, there is always, regardless of our circumstances, there's always the larger story that we can play an active part in. Mm -hmm. I mean, our our place in a larger story isn't limited by circumstances. It isn't limited in the way that our hopes and dreams for vocation are. We mm. have a significant role in a larger story, though we seem to be living in a small one. And it's huge. It's huge. Brother Lawrence, fairly famous Christian monk in the uh, Middle Ages in France, his job was cook in the monastery, peeled potatoes, you know. He made goulash, you know. He's making porridge in the morning, you know. His job was cook. But because of his walk with God, he ended up becoming a counselor and advisor to kings and princes and abbots and bishops. And, you know, this man had such a remarkable life in God that though his life vocationally looked like super small story, stuck in this out-of-the-way monastery in the kitchen. In fact, he's having this huge impact in the lives of others and in nations, Hmm. you know, because of his walk with God. So just a little side note to illustrate, yeah, the larger story is always going on. And you have a role in that, regardless of what vocation may be. So what are some other categories, John, that we can think of that would be helpful interpreting the fact that our vocational realities just don't match our heart's desires, our yearning, our sense of how we can really make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Again, let me just repeat, mythic versus specific is really important in the realm of dream and desire. When we were starting Ransomed Heart, we were convinced that, you know, God had a ranch for us. And we used the term the ranch. You know, we kept talking about it, dreaming about it. And, you know, the day that God said, no, you're actually, it's not a ranch. I was devastated. I was crestfallen. I was heartbroken. And I wouldn't talk to God for days after that. I was mad. And mythic versus specific. I look back on that now and go, thank God, thank you that you thwarted us buying a ranch. Like, that's not us. That We're not supposed to be innkeepers. Thank you, God. So mythic versus specific. You may think you're in a backwater because you attached, you know, your dreams and desires to a specific outcome, but just backing up and saying, Lord, show me what the expression is that you do have for it. I think also in the realm of job versus calling, just trying to keep those two things separate. Look at Paul, yes. right? I mean, Paul sewed fabric, St. Paul. He was a tent maker in those days, and that's how he supported himself while he brought the gospel to those you know cities in Asia Minor that he was traveling to. And you think, whoa, Paul? I mean... Oh, surely he's supported. Surely he's, you know, he's funded. He was working. Yeah. Right? And he didn't seem to find that incongruous at all. It's like grateful for his job because it gave him, you know, food and rent. Mm -hmm. So then he could do what he really wants to do. I just think it's helpful that we separate job from calling, dream, desire, that sort of thing. I mean, you, you may remain a school teacher. But you end up chasing your dream to, you know, be a writer Mm -hmm. or go on mission trips overseas. You know, you may remain a programmer, right? But you may fulfill your calling, you know, working with young men in the inner city or that kind of thing. So just separate mythic from specific, separate job from calling, right? And then I think there are some other categories. I think 
training Mm -hmm. to handle it Mm -hmm. is an absolutely huge category. And this is where many people lose heart in the training. That in order for God to entrust a person with their dreams coming true, an awful lot has got to take place in their character. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I mean, you know, if you want to be that best-selling author or I remember talking to a, a man who, you know, his dream and longing was to have a huge church. And I was trying to show him, do you understand that God's not going to give that to you while your dream and longing is to have a huge church? Yeah. Like, that's the wrong, like, do you want to bring the word of God? Bring it. You want to see people's lives change? Go for it. Don't start out with, but it has to be mega successful, right? And there was, before that guy could be entrusted with having a mega successful ministry, there was a lot that needed to happen in his training, in his character, healing of brokenness, dealing with sin issues and self-absorption and such. So you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. For that guy, God saving him from a boatload of heartache and probably a congregation from just a premature leader, you know, a king who's <laughs> too young. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm laughing because I was counseling another couple several years ago and pastor and his wife and they were in just a nasty church kind of split thing going on and and at one point he says to me I might lose my job and I looked at him and I said do you understand what an enormous blessing that would be (laughs) to be cut free from all of this like um, training to handle it you know and allowing that to be a category of you know, Jesus, I feel stuck right now. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're working on other things. Yeah, It goes with that same idea of in listening prayer. When you're practicing listening prayer and you're not hearing from God, you're not getting an answer, change the question. That's almost always what's going on mm-hmm. is that God says, we're not talking about that today. I'm not talking to you about your relationship with your mom. I want to talk to you about your posture towards mm-hmm. what? Something else. Cynicism, greed, anger, rage, you know, so change the question. Same yes. thing in this is that if you're not getting vocational answers, change the question. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's working on something else in you mm-hmm. so that you can be entrusted to handle what he does have for you. Yeah. yeah, I think our focus is usually external circumstances, issues, obstacles, and And most often God's focus is internal, kind of issues of the heart, motive, intent, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I think tied with that training, John, it's just it's just another way of saying it. But God may have a a goal in mind for us. And you have to be the sergeant and the captain before you can be the general. And this is where asking God comes in is, Lord, what are you doing in this season of my life? Where is it headed? Where is it going? And even knowing, you know, your new name, kind of the direction and the flow of who and what God is making you and how he's shaping you gives you hope that, okay, I'm a sergeant. I'm going to get everything I can as a sergeant out of it because I'm going to need it to be a captain. And then down the road. And so many of our aspirations, frankly, I think come much later in life. We realize Oh, my gosh, decades have been spent preparing me for this. And this is close, real close, if not exactly what I was yearning for. Let me give you and I as an example. Mm -hmm. What was your first job in the church? Janitor. Clean those toilets, set up Fred's staff hall for the women's circle, get the gym mopped, get the kitchen clean. Yeah, toilets, rooms. But you're calling was pastor. Yeah. So, I mean, what's with that? It's like, wait, janitor? How come you weren't put, you know, directly into a position of teaching thousands? Yeah. I wondered that. (laughs) And? Gifting, being wasted. Yes. Flushed down the toilet, as it were. Literally. (laughs) And yet God was up to something in those days. Yeah. Right? Yeah. My story is exactly the same. My first job in the church janitor, Mm -hmm. scrubbing toilets, vacuuming rooms, taking out the trash. 
And I have seen this in many, many men's lives, that before God will let a man become a king, yes. he actually has to start as a servant. Mm-hmm. And we chafe at that. And it feels so, I'm on the wrong track. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, you're on the right track. You're on, yes. the, you're on the train you're supposed to be on. It's just that you're in training. Mm-hmm. And I'm smiling as I'm thinking about my son, Sam, right now, 25 years old. I know that Samuel is a king. I know it. I've seen it in him. I've seen his gifting. I know that he has a great role in the kingdom of God. He's bussing tables. Mm. And it's killing him. And he's just going, wait, what? Like, where? I'm in a nowhere job. I'm a total dead end. And I'm just smiling, going, oh, no. You are in the workshop of God, Mm -hmm. my son. You are right where you need to be. You are being trained at this level in order to handle other things as you move up. Yeah. Oh, just to have that interpretation and understanding of where I am in a, you know, a 28 chapter story that is my life that I'm, I'm still in the early chapters. The, you know, that's huge, huge. and so helpful. Huge. So ask Jesus yes. if he's not changing the vocational circumstances, ask him, what are we working on, Lord? What is this season in my life about? What are we working on here? Because, right, if he gives you a context, okay, right now at this season in your life, this is what we're doing, you can settle into that. You can go, okay, this doesn't mean I'm stuck. It doesn't mean my story's not going anywhere. It's just that God's working on other things that will prepare me to move into the next phases. Yeah. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast, and we're going to invite you to join us next time as we continue in the series on interpretation. Thanks for listening.